Times of Dallas continues on TNN. The producers of Dallas thought the modern Southwest would provide a fresh setting for primetime television and decided Texas was the perfect bigger-than-life backdrop for a bigger-than-life family like the Ewings. There's something to be said, I think, still about the mystique of Texas. It's a kind of a vast state of mind. It's not really real unless you live there. If you live there and pay property taxes, it's real. But uh, to most people who have never been there, it's almost like a, a mythical country. The romance of the West has captured the imagination of a lot of people over the years, including a young boy growing up in the suburbs of Los Angeles in the 1950s named Steve Kennelly. My very favorite character was William Boyd, who was Hopalong Cassidy. In the 50s, television was full of uh, wonderful uh, short television uh, half hours, uh, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and many others, the Cisco Kid and so on and so forth, and I loved those shows. As he grew up, Steve never really thought about being an actor, much less pretending to be a cowboy for a living. It was just his fate. Steve was drafted into the Vietnam War and served as a radio operator in the helicopter corps. He made it back home safely and by chance met screenwriter John Milius, who hired Steve because of his experiences in Vietnam to consult on the script for Apocalypse Now. During that time, Steve was introduced to director John Houston, who needed some cowboy types for the film he was beginning to shoot called The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean. And Steve suddenly began a new career. He appeared in a number of westerns and other films over the years. And when it was time to start casting Dallas, the producers asked him to come and discuss playing one of the roles in their new series. I'm thinking about playing uh, Bobby, sort of like the character out of Giant and, uh, that James Dean played. And I, I've come in for this role. and. There's, a, there's an office full of young, ingenue, blonde types, and I know one, and I say, can I see a script? And just for a sec, and I page through it, and here's Ray Krebs uh, in the hayloft with this little cute gal, Lucy, and then Ray's girlfriend, Pam, is marrying his employer's son, Bobby. And, uh, well, there's a problem. Then Ray and JR are conspiring to break up this marriage, and Ray flies a helicopter, and he runs this ranch. And I was going, now there's a role. I've always wanted to do a, a Western character uh, in a series, and literally within days after that, we were on our way to Dallas to uh, begin the first five shows. The city of Dallas, the Big D, still had a cowboy tradition, while it also was becoming a center of brash new wealth, which perfectly reflected the old and new generations of the Ewing clan. Texans are also known for their independence and determination not to knuckle under at any cost. Historically, this is best symbolized by the legendary last stand at the Alamo. There's a strong feeling in the West that you can push me and I'll give, I'll give ground for a while. Yeah, you're the reason Mickey's in the hospital. But if you push me one time a little too hard on top of that, then that's it. <laughs> In Dallas, at its best, you had that feeling about all the characters. J.R. was always stirring up trouble and pushing a lot of people too hard and too often. When CBS requested a couple of additional episodes be produced to chase the steadily climbing ratings during the second season, it was decided it was time for J.R. to get his comeuppance. So Leonard Katzman, Arthur Lewis, the rest of the writing staff are sitting around, sitting around, trying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, we were pretty much wrapped up this season. Um, well, why don't we just shoot them? Now, I don't know who said that, but that's the idea. Well, well, who? Well, who's going to shoot them? Well, we'll have the camera come in, handheld, 
from a subjective point of view, Larry walks up to the door. We don't even need to see a person. You hear the shot? He takes the hit. Freeze frame, end of season. Well, what next? Well, we've got months to figure that out. It could be anybody. To make the most out of this cliffhanger and help create a media sensation, they filmed many of the actors taking a turn, giving JR what he richly deserved. None of us really knew who shot JR. So we all did, you know, different endings, and mine was something really ridiculous, like having a gun going, take that, that, and that, you schmuck, or something like that. So I knew mine was not going to be used. <laughs> It's not every day that the lead character of a popular series gets gunned down, and suddenly all over the world people were debating and betting about the most asked question in the summer of 1981, who shot JR? The whole world was caught up in that, uh, in that thing. If you remember, there were bumper stickers, who shot JR? I never did understand it. I never did understand what the what the craze was and why everybody went so nuts about it. I, I, th I thought the man probably ought to be shot. The PR just kept churning it out. The attention got hotter. Larry held out on his contract, and we went back into production. Larry decided, and rightly so, that, you know, he was the dog pulling the sled. And he just step back and said, I'm not ready to come back yet. And so that thing was going on. By the time we got back as a full cast and shot the first couple of episodes, I mean, we were at the top of the pile by then. Viewers had to wait until the beginning of the next season to see if JR survived. It was soon revealed that it was Mary Crosby who had fired the famous shot. In the meantime, Dallas had become part of ratings and television history. Life and Times of Dallas return. With the amazing success of Dallas, several other primetime soap operas appeared during the 1980s. But for many years, Dallas remained the most popular and most talked about series on television. We'd sit in the makeup room and we'd see who was being trashed in The Inquirer or The Star this week, or we'd get on Wednesday mornings, we'd run get the LA Times and see if we'd beat Dynasty in the ratings, <laughs> you know? It was it was really fun. For a while, that was a big deal, boy, battling for that first and second position between Dynasty and Dallas. Primetime soap fans know that Gary, Miss Ellie's and Jock's other son, and his wife, Valene, spent little time at South Fork and moved further west to a quiet little cul-de-sac known as Knott's Landing. What most people don't know is that Dallas creator David Jacobs actually went to CBS with the idea for Knott's Landing first, and Dallas may have never existed. And they had the big pitch where you go in and you try and convince this network that this show is what they need to do. And they went, oh, I don't know, a cul-de-sac, separate people and everything. He said, don't you have anything else? Something that was all like in one tight group. And off the top of his head, literally, David said, well, have this idea of this family and he was like spinning this stuff and he said it was just like and it's a rich texas and they went oh that's good can you show us that david was singing extemporaneously an aria from an opera not yet written and they bought it cbs wanted the new idea to be put into production as fast as possible linda gray was cast to play jr's long-suffering wife sue ellen after Patrick Duffy was cast to play Bobby, they needed to find an actress to play Pam, his new bride. And we met with two actresses to see who would be Pamela. They were going to come in and read. And the first one came in and was a remarkably talented young actress from uh, New York, whose name I have, has escaped me right now. And I thought, wow, she's like really good. And then they said, in essence, next, and they, they brought in and in walked Victoria Principal in the tightest jeans I've ever seen, the most unbelievable blouse, and I just went, hello, Pam, 